Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the session this afternoon. Um, the session is led by Gail Elliott um, from Dementiability. And I'm going to hand you over to Gail now, who's going to run the rest of the session. If you have any questions at all during the session, do pop them in the chat and we'll try and answer them for you. OK, over to you, Gail. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Yeah. And thank Hillary as well for inviting me to speak about uh, at creating memory books, my life in facts and photos. The reason I called this wow, my life in facts and photos is the wow model is the, the central uh, tool to using the dementiability methods. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about brain and behavior and knowing the person. Uh, so you can understand not just um, how to put a book together, but what the important elements are so that they will be set up for success. As I begin, I just want to say that um, I do make always make this statement that we do need to respect COVID guidelines right now. And I leave it to everybody to look at your own public health guidelines. And also think about this as a time when families can't be going in to visit with loved ones as an opportune time to talk to them about creating a book of memories for their loved ones so that if they can't be with them, they're not forgetting them, the details will be in hard copy and the staff will now know what to talk about them in facts and photos. Before I go any further, I wanna say thank you to all of you for the work you're doing to support our uh, community, our um, many people who are needing support and care, frail, vulnerable adults, and particularly people living with dementia as that's the focus of this. And it doesn't have to be just dementia as we go forward thinking about what a memory book is. So let's begin. Can you imagine what it must be like to fail in every conversation? Can you imagine what it must be like to forget the names and the faces of those you love? I think I know you. Can you imagine what it must be like to forget the names of your best friends? And can you imagine what it must be like to forget the things you have done, the places you have been, the joys of your previous days? The dementiability methods are centered on the person. So we need to know about the person. And that is why um, a, light, a, a story with facts and photos, a book of facts and photos is so key to putting dementiability methods into action and putting what you're doing into practice. The dementiability methods focus on research from multiple disciplines. And I move this research into education so we can change practice together as a team. So knowing that, one of the things we have to think about is why do we need to know about all of this um, when we're thinking about life stories? As I said, the WOW model is central to everything we do. The WOW model is, is a simple tool that you can now all use in daily practice. The first W is for who. Who is this person? Who are they right now? Who were they in the past? What do you know? It's the details of from the beginning until the present that need to be captured because a person's memory bank is often closed. So who is this person past and present? This will be important. We need to know what their needs are, their interests. What are they able to do? What are their skills and abilities? Once you know all that, then you can start to apply your observations. Sometimes when you know who the person is and was, the observations in the present make an awful lot more sense. Once you gather all that information, the who, past and present observations, now we can figure out what it is we need to do. So I just wanna give you an example of this to convince you about why we need this information for everybody caring for people who experience memory loss. So this is an example of a case that happened. Um, actually, it was one day when I was teaching and the staff said, see that man? And there was a window across the back of the room. And they said, see that man walking by here? He may have moved in here a few days ago. 
goes into every resident room and he yells at them. He screams. And then the resident screams back. And all we've done since he moved in is we've dealt with screaming matches. They said, if you can do something for him, then I believe there's something we can do in dementia care, but I don't know what we're going to do with him. So let's apply the, the WHO model or the WOW model. The first, we already have our observations. The staff are saying he goes into the room, he screams at everybody. I wanna know who the person was in the past. In the present, we know he has dementia. We knew, know he moved into a new home. Who was he in the past? So when I teach this, people say he might've been a nurse. What else might he have been? A security guard. Well, the answer is he was a principal. And the, the reason I bring this case up is when I asked them, what did this person do for a living? What do you think they said? Most common answer I get wherever I go. We don't know. This is why you need a memory book is because had they known this and they used the WOW model, they could have figured this out right from the beginning. This man was a principal in the past. This is what the hallway looked like. He now lives in long-term care. What does the hallway look like? So I told them, I want you now to go back and I want you to one more time observe. I bet you didn't see what you think you saw. So they stood back, watched him go down the hall. He stopped at the door. This is not actually the, the actual nursing home. I've just taken another nursing home, so I'm not giving away the case. He stopped at the residence door and he went in and he goes, is everything okay in here? He did not go into that room and yell at people. What happened is the hallway triggered his habits from the past. This is spared memory in dementia. He went in, they screamed at him, he screamed back. What did the resident or what did the staff think? He screamed at the residents. Had they known he was a principal, had they understand that who he was in the past connected to the observation in the present, now we can figure out what to do. So we're gonna talk about a number of things and we then in the, the workshop go through what we're gonna do with him now. And I, I'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. So the point is, if we're going to use person-centered, non-pharmacological, multidisciplinary, evidence-based approaches to care, such as the dementiability methods, we have to take the person into account. We need to know who they were and who they are. So these are the important elements of meeting the needs of those in our care. The first thing we need to know is that all behavior has meaning. So what is it saying? Knowing who a person is and who they were will help us to figure this out. So this personal story is a key component, but so is the brain. We also have to figure out what's going on at the brain level. So when we figure out our observations with the who, we're a little more informed before we can figure out the last W of what to do. So in dementia care, you all know these terms. Um, I'm not sure if you call them neurocognitive disorders or, or um, types of dementia, um, but here are the different forms of neurocognitive disorders, forms of dementia. I'm not gonna cover all of this. What I do wanna bring up is the who in the present, you need to figure out what type of dementia is it? How impaired is the brain? How progressive is it? What are their abilities in the, in, in the present? Is it memory? Is it judgment? What's going on? What do we know? So knowing about the type of dementia and what's going on is important. The other thing is knowing how advanced it is, it's important to understand this concept of Barry Reisberg and Olga Emery. We develop like this and we undevelop like this. So if I'm way down here, I need to make sure that whatever you give me in my memory book is very concrete not abstract thinking, but concrete words, things that I can understand because I may only be operating at maybe a, um, the age of eight brain. We need to make sure we connect what we know to what we do. So an understanding of the brain is really important. 
uh, and obviously in a one hour presentation, I can't cover all these things, but these are the kinds of things that we talk about is understanding brain and behavior. But one term I do wanna bring out from all of this conversation is the term anosognosia. If I don't understand that there is something wrong with me, if I don't know, I don't know. I'm not, under, I'm not able to understand or appreciate my actions, my decisions, my feelings. So if I don't know, I don't know, don't argue with me. You won't win. I'm always right. So a person with dementia may not understand that what you're trying to tell them, explain to them is based on uh, what you and I who are of um, or who are able to function cognitively really do understand. So when we look at memory books, one of the things we have to talk about is truth telling and ethics. So in the memory book, are you going to say, I live here now in this nursing home, if that person gets upset, when they don't understand this is where they need to live, I can, I'm independent, I don't need to live, live here. So when you're coming up with your wording, I want you to think about this term, if I don't understand and appreciate that I have dementia, and people often with more of a vascular involvement uh, have lost that kind of insight. So don't argue with them, come up with other kinds of wording. So when I put my memory book, um, uh, when I was doing my details and whenever I talked to my mom, I never called it an, a nursing home, a long-term care home where she lived for the last eight months of her life. I said, hey, mom, we have found a new apartment building for you. And that worked. Ethics is do no harm. And if this helps soften the blow, help people to live a better life, isn't that a better way to approach that? So think about if there's pages in the book that are going to trigger negative responses, do it, don't, don't use that page, change it to something else. We also need, we, we need to think about needs, interests, skills, and abilities. What do you know about all of this? What we know, most of the, when you look at behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia, we call them responsive behaviors. Much of what we see with responsive behaviors are related to boredom, loneliness, lack of success, and lack of care and compassion. This is research from across disciplines. So when you put a memory book together, boredom, I now have something to do, loneliness, now maybe I can do it with somebody because now somebody knows what to talk to me about. A lot of people stop communicating with a person with dementia because they don't know what to talk about. When I created a memory book for my mom, every time somebody came and sat, uh, came and visited her, they, she made them sit down with her. It was, like, oh, we have to go through my memory book today. So it gave them something to talk about instead of asking questions about their life, the facts were there and then that would launch brain cascades, new memories, other memories that would be shared. So now we have the details in our book were set up for success and that's caring and compassionate care. So thinking about the brain, we also have to think about memory. Some memory is lost and some memory is spared. This is an important part of putting memory books together. The memory that is lost are your conscious memories, memory for facts. The memory that is spared is the unconscious memory, your conditioned behaviors, repetitive priming. Now, where does this come together in a memory book? Your memory book is gonna contain the facts that I can read now and share, or you can read to me and share with me, but your motor memory may be spared and I can be taught to go to my book and look at my book. It can eventually become a trigger. So declarative memory is for facts about a person's life, and world events. So think about a person's life. What are the most common questions people ask? Oh, how many children do you have? What did you do for a living? What did you do today? They can't remember what they ate. They can't remember the names of their family. We need to really think about what their memory bank is, a bit, is able to do. Sorry, memory bank closed for the day. No withdrawals available. When you think about the memory bank as being closed, offer the details and open up the doors to the memory bank. So this is a video. I wanna show you 
um, that one's memory bank may not always, you can, you can ask questions, but sometimes it will be closed. Watch this video and see what happens. When you think of your favorite TV shows, what do you like? Would you like uh, Jessica Fletcher? Oh, Murder, She Wrote. Murder, She Wrote, yeah. Murder, She Wrote, yeah. What other, what other ones? I can't think right off of hand. Do you like Three's Company? Eh? Three's Company. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then... Three's Company. Any other funny, any other funny movies? Not that I can think of. Okay, so Murder She Wrote and Three's Company. Yeah, that's what. Those are TV shows. What What about movies? Do you remember having a favorite movie? Okay. This is the most common response you get when you talk to people with dementia. So, what movie did you like? I don't know. What shows did you like? Oh, I don't know. Did you like Jessica Fletcher? Oh, Murder She Wrote. Yes. She gave her the first word, she got a second word, and the rest of it ended up with a standard kind of conversation you get in dementia care. With no, we ask people about facts of their life and what they enjoyed, they can't do it, the memory bank is closed. Now watch the smile when she does get an answer and then watch her face when she can't come up with an answer. Your favorite singer, remember um, Engelbird? Yeah. What was his last name? Engelbert Humperdinck. Yeah, he was your favorite. That's what I'll remember. Yeah. Um, what other, any so, any songs that you remember? Eh? Any of your favorite songs? Engelbert, any of his, his songs? Okay. So in a memory book, it can say, you, I enjoyed listening to Engelbert Humperdinck. My favorite songs were, and now you list them. Her brain is not able to provide those details, but I bet if you gave her some of those songs and started singing them give, them, give her the words too. My guess is she'll remember some of those words. So if we need these details, where do we find them? Where are most of these details kept? They're kept in a computer. The person with dementia needs these, they're not gonna be accessing those details. Lots of information is collected in care organizations, but it's never shared or it's shared with a small team. How many people are covered in a team meeting and how much time do they have to learn about a person's life? And my question to you is, if they collect this information, who gets to look at it? Does family know what you've collected? And does nursing, have all the details? Will they share that with recreation? What about housekeeping? Who's on the floor? Most often, housekeeping and dietary are often the ones that have a lot of one-on-one -on -one involvement. Get the information out of the computer and into the hands of those who need it because too many people say, I don't know these details because I'm not allowed in the computer. We, we often don't have time. So, if you do have time and you collect the information, do you share it? And the answer is often no. So I encourage organizations to have as many departments sharing some space as possible because it's the, the side off conversations that um, one often learns a lot about the, uh, the residents. Um, and in the community, if we had memory books, it would be great for people to be able to know and have facts to talk about. So this is why we need to get the life story and facts and photos out of the computer and into the hands of those who need it. So how do we do this? By now, hopefully um, you've downloaded a copy of the book. This book is available uh, for this workshop for a free download. After the workshop, um, uh, people will need to, to purchase the book and we will make it available as an electronic file. We have a very brief overview. It's called All About Me, a free download on our, our website as well. If you want something that is just quick to look at, in fact, this is what we filled out and put on my mom's door when she lived in long-term care and the staff would use that as a at a glance bit of information. This book here is available on my website as a free download as well. This one is available in many languages. 
Um, it's a PowerPoint, so you can drag in your photos, change the details as you want. Um, and we also have uh, one more language coming soon. And I, um, oh yeah, the uh, Spanish, oh, it's right there, Spanish coming soon, already there. Before I go forward, I do want to acknowledge the work of Dr. Michelle Bourgeois. She has done the research uh, behind memory books and uh, she's the one that has guided a lot of this practice um, related to putting memory books into, into action. And a big piece of it is, if you go back to this page here, you'll notice it's photo from the past, photo from the present, photo from the past, photo from the present. What the research has shown, um, Dr. Bourgeois has shown that if you have a picture from the past, that may be the picture they, they recognize. They may not recognize this person or they might. How many of you have had this happen to you? You show a picture like this to a person in your care and they go, oh, that's not me, that's my mother. Because their memory is impaired and they don't, they don't realize that this is what they look like today. So in a memory book, we'll have those pictures, past and present. But before we go any further, I just have to go a little bit more into who is this person. We need to know if they're able to read in the present. We need to figure out if they could read in the past. The first thing we need to think about is if they could read in the past, they probably can read in the present, but we have to test this out. So let's say that we found out that they did read in the past. Now we need to know is, is it possible the reason they're not reading is because they can't see the size of the font. So we use a reading screen um, to test to see what size of per, uh, font the person can see. And if it's this size here, and our, our, our tool actually tells you what size each one is, your memory book has to have at least this size when you put the words into the book. Because if you do it this size, and this is all they can see, your memory book's not gonna work for them. Somebody else can read it, but they won't be able to see it. The other thing about reading rules is, is when you do your printing in your reading book, in your, in your uh, memory book here, try not to do um, curly fonts. It's harder for people with dementia to, to read it. It doesn't mean they can't. It just is harder. Research on vision and aging says it's better if we use capital letters followed by small. So two words guide all our thinking in, in dementability, familiar and contrast. So we learned with capitals followed by small, it's easier. If you try to read this statement here, you avoid using all capital letters. If I make it in the side, same size, look at how this is easier for your eyes to follow than this. So make sure it can be seen and you're using color contrast. Now we need to think about abilities. We need to think about if we're putting information into the memory book, the more cognitively impaired I am, you may need fewer details because they may not be able to handle more details. However, there could be extra points in there for somebody else to read to them in smaller print if that's helpful. You're going to do what makes sense for the person. And one other point I have to make is there are many people who are illiterate. We need to keep this in mind as well. If a person is illiterate, don't assume you don't put the, the points in there in wording. They, the person who's providing care needs those facts. So collect the information from other people so somebody else can read the words to them um, in a way that is respectful and dignified. So taking this into account, I want to show you how this information about my abilities, that's why this is called dementiability, is we're exposing abilities. We get the right size font. We make sure we use an aerial font with no curls as best as possible, making sure that we're not using anything too, too curly and basic language. This woman, Carol's mom, I have permission for this video. Carol said, she came to my workshop and she said, Gail, my mom hasn't, my mom can't read. The doctors told me that. That was three years ago. No, she can't read. So she went home and she said, I'm going to do a memory book and see what happens. This is her mom reading the, for the first time after three years of being told she can't read. I'll be in on Thursday, July the 14th. 1927. A baby girl was born in London, Ontario, 
to Rachel and Arthur and Arthur TV. She was a beautiful little baby with green eyes. Who's that? Well, who's the beautiful little baby with green eyes? This is Audrey. So who's Audrey? So it was me. Yeah, she was a little, little baby with green eyes. Well, I have green eyes. So it's you. Huh? That's the book of Audrey. That's the story of you. Oh, oh. it all began on Thursday, July the 14th. July the 14th is my birthday, isn't it? It is. Yeah. 1927, a baby girl was born in London, Ontario to Rachel and Arthur Katie. She was a beautiful little baby with green eyes. <laughs> Do I still have green eyes? You have still beautiful green eyes. Wow. This is so this is the first time she's read in three years. Her abilities have been spared, and that's why you need to know that declarative memory, the facts have not been retained. She reads them, and, oh, do I, is this still here? The ability under procedural memory, the skill to read has been spared. So watch this. This is a few days later, and what I want you to look at is her face now. The first time she's concentrating, she's stiff. Watch this one. little baby with green eyes. Oh my God, have I still got green eyes? You do. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. And uh, nice. look at how much brighter her face is. Just a few days later, she's developed uh, some self-confidence. My brother named Ralph, he was the oldest and, and, and took very good care of his, his sisters when her his mother, Rachel, got sick and couldn't take care of her. And that's just within a few days. Our goal in, with, with the dementia ability methods is to expose abilities. There's a body of literature called excess disability. A lot of what we see in dementia is not because of dementia, it's because of disuse. So memory books, my life story has many benefits beyond just the, the, the reminiscing component. So Sue, could we send, I, I have this one pager that I could uh, ask you to post on your website, send out to anybody who came. This is the five basic steps we're gonna cover about how we are now going to put the memory book into my, uh, my life story, into facts and photos. Um, so, you can use, as, as I'm talking, I'm going to use this one, but it everything I'm talking about can apply to whatever format you use in putting a memory book together. So the first step is to gather pictures. Gather pictures from the past and the present of, of loved ones, um, vacations, jobs, and then see what you've got. Lay them out, have a look through the book, and, and ask yourself, what kinds of pictures do I want to collect for my loved one's memory book, this, this life story? Once you have started collecting pictures, sort out your photos. So you might have to go to your, your cell phone for pictures. You might have them on your iPad. You may have them on your computer. Print some of the ones that you want to use or consider. Photocopy any of the hard copies that you've got. Now let's start getting ourselves organized with some of the pictures that we might have and we might want to use. Now put point and two, one and two together. As you start gathering these, sort them, photocopy, in case you lose it. My mom lost her book and I wish I had uh, uh, photocopied the whole book when I was done, but I did find it again. So my lesson to you is if it's for your loved one, make sure you take a copy of it in case it gets lost. So what do we need to do? We're going to put the photos that match up together in two piles. This is actually my mother. She was a triplet. This is a picture of the three of them when they were little. And this is a picture of them on their 80th birthday. 
So as I was looking for pictures, I would put pictures of them in the past, pictures of them in the present. There would be another pile, pictures of her children in the past, pictures of her children in the present. So now you have things connected for easy um, installation into the book. Now, one of the biggest reasons people say they don't do memory books is they say, I don't have any pictures. This does not have to stop us. If we don't have pictures from the past, search the internet, search um, Google, search magazines, go on your computer, print things from the internet, put pictures in that you want to scan and get, it, get the photos. I try to use a higher quality of paper when I'm doing the printing because I photocopy all my pictures before they go in the book. So I get the photo quality paper. So the colors come up. They're a little brighter than if you use regular paper, but you can use regular paper, use whatever way you want to do it. So now I've Google searched, I've printed the pictures or I've scanned through magazines. This person was a secretary. So this isn't her, but can say, this could say, I was a secretary, much like this person. I was a girl guide. My husband used to work in the garden. My job was to cook what he grew. And you can either use the real picture or say, this is similar to the garden we had when we were newly married. So how do you search? In the search bar, you can do things like houses from the 1930s. Think about how old the person is now and put them back into their childhood for childhood memories and into their youth for those kinds of memories. So if I'm working with an 80 year old and I want the 20, 20s, I go back 60 years. If I'm working with um, them even younger, I go back even further and then find the geography. Are you in England? Are you in Toronto? Are you in Australia? Put the area in because you'll see different images. This one is actually an image I typed in houses from the 19, I think this was 40s, 1940s England. So if you recognize something like that, that's familiar to it, you, that's what I found on the internet. This is a great one for somebody that is a, a nurse graduate from the 1940s. So this one I found in graduate uh, graduating class 19, nursing graduating class 1940s. This would be a picture you could say, this looks like my graduating class. It, you're not saying it was, it looks like my graduating class. Notice, and you'll, you'll see this, some people will say, notice how everybody's dress is about the same length because we measured from the floor up. We all had to be exactly the same. Details that are fun and easy to share. Now, as you go into the pages of the book, one way to do this is you can actually um, make your notes on your computer, type them up, and I use um, Arial uh, bold font, and then I just cut it out and glue it in to the book. I find it easier to type. In this book, book this person wanted a picture of, they, they used to love going camping. They had no camping photos, camping pictures, 1960s. There was a, po a photo. So this looks like the tent we used to put up when we were camping. In this one, see the title I wanna show you here, photos and stories about our life together. Took a totally different uh, direction in this one. Photos about our life together was about, they owned a home hardware, or not a home hardware, pardon me, a hardware store. So they could they had no pictures of the store where they used to work. So they just Googled a bunch of pictures. And then this picture is actually from a magazine. That's now got pictures and facts. So if the person doesn't remember the facts, they can read them or you can read the facts to them and have a conversation. My husband owned a large hardware store he worked very long hours away from home. What was that like for you? Now you're seeking an opinion. People with dementia can offer an opinion, but it's hard to pull out a fact from the memory bank. But once you open the memory bank, other things often follow. And I'm gonna show you a video of that in just a minute. The other place you can look is go to Pinterest. 
Pinterest has amazing things. And if you go to the Dementiability Pinterest site, you'll see things like reminiscing. You'll see things like old cars. You'll see things like old television, um, toys from the past fashions from the past, kitchens from the past, all of these things can be used later. But for right now, we're searching. What else can we find? So once again, with pets, do we, do we print it out or do we put a photo in? And ideally, photos and words are a good thing to have. But this is a really good one for somebody in the later stages that may not be doing so much reading, but just loves looking at a picture of their dog. Here's another way to do it. Some people with about their foods type it all out, but this person got all the pages done with um, a magazine and found the foods that this person enjoyed. Here's another thing, things I like to do now. This one was a list. This one was, look at this beautiful picture of her with her granddaughter. Now that absolutely sparks memory. This person was an avid reader. So they, um, so Wendy got a picture of some books and said, um, I've read hundreds of books. So this sparks the memory because of the books, the picture of the books. And this was another one that I really liked is things I like to do when I have a spare time. One person has typed it up and put it in their book, but Wendy's mother loved doing puzzles. So she actually got a page out of um, a, a, one of the puzzle books that she had not, not done and taped it into the book. It triggers memories at that point and reminds her of how much fun she has doing these puzzles. The book also has a lot of blank pages. So if you don't know what to do with these blank pages, use the wow model. Who was this person in the past? What do you know? What did they like? What would they like to remember? So I'm just going to show you how you can begin. Does anything on this page trigger memories for any of you? If you wouldn't mind just putting it in the chat box. And Sue, if you would give me some information about what you're getting. Hi there. Right. Um, we've got, there's so many. <laughs> right, cabbage right. patch yes, Ghostbusters, free Furbies, Hungry Hippos, Furbies, Cabbage Patch Kids. My mum looked so hard to find me one. Good, 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 good. That's what. <laughs> so uh, the, the, the Cabbage Patch doll in particular is one that I thought would be. So as you look at those comments, which is coming up more, Cabbage Patch or Barbie? Oh, it's called uh, Cindy, Furbies, Hungry, Hungry Hippos, Batman, Hungry Hippos. Ghost, but I think it's difficult. <laughs> okay, so the point in this is, is exactly the point I wanted to make. See how it's different, how you've all got something that's triggering something. This is what the memory book needs to do. Something that it comes up, and you go, oh yeah. So what I, you did, thank you for that comment. This is the perfect one. Oh, how hard it was for my mom to get me that Cabbage Patch doll. You just showed me how one image brought back a memory. And something I ask you to think about with those comments, when was the last time you thought about some of these things on the page? And obviously these are younger people. Um, if we go to the next slide, it's different images. And one of the images that I did have, and I think I it, it didn't end up getting put in this slide was um, if there's anybody in this group um, who's older, like I am, um, you may remember a doll. I, I'm not sure if you had it in the UK or not, but here, one of the most popular dolls when I was a child was uh, Chatty Cathy. And everybody just wanted a Chatty Cathy. I never had one. We didn't have the money for that. Um, but that brings up all kinds of memories for me about a really special doll that a friend of mine had had, and that was fun. So when you look at this, so for example, being in England, how many of you uh, know who Thomas the Tank Engine is? 
so are naughty. And as I bring these up, how many of you have these memories that you haven't thought about for a long time? By providing the fact, we launch new memories. So we need to think about brain and behavior, who the person is and who they were. And think about a school classroom back then. One of the things that's really fun to put in a memory book is uh, when I went to school, I had an inkwell with a fountain pen. There were no ballpoint pens when many of us were growing up. So there's all kinds of things. Oh yeah, I haven't thought about that for a long time. And in the UK, how many people would really love a little bit of information about what it was like watching the Queen's inauguration or maybe something about Princess Diana. So the, think about the themes and, and what would really spark some interesting conversation and memories. How many people in that generation remember their phone looking like this? And how many of us re remember the party line? You didn't have just one person listening in on your call. It could be the whole street. So there's all kinds of things on these extra pages that you can do that can be quite fun. So let's look at what we can do with them. It might be something about where they work, the people they worked with. Or um, in uh, this is the case of, um, this was actually my mom. She loved doing family tree with my aunt. So put the family tree in and some of the old photos and then remind her that they found some really interesting information, such as one of my great, great uncles is in um, Buckingham Palace, apparently. And there's a head of him because he was, he was a Duke or something. Um, I have to I'll always check these uh, pieces of information because I wouldn't remember unless it was written down. So ask yourself, what, what do you want to know? What kinds of things trigger memories? So is it old hair dryers? Is it old kitchens? Is it an old car? How about life for women in the 1950s? This person said, my job was to clean the house because my, my husband was way too busy with work. And I felt that was fair. Do you feel that way? It doesn't matter. Ask for their opinion. What do you think it's like today when men help out in the kitchen? If this is what she said, you can launch the conversation in a different way. This is an old track. What's the story that goes with it? And here's one I encourage you all to think about. What was it like when they were teenagers? Did they go to a malt shop? Did they go to a pub? Did they wear a poodle skirt? What were the things that were going on at the time? And what was the music? And list it. And there's a, a sheet on that there. And many of them will talk about how they listened to the radio. And that was their family experience. There might be a show they all sat and listened to together before the TV. Another really good one is when, when did the first TV come to our street? When did the first color TV come to our street? This is how you can fill in these blank pages. This is a great one here that you might wanna put in for many people. When you had children, did as you create the families created, were children left out on the front porch? Because people don't do that today, most of the time. Children played outside all day. And this was, I thought this was a great one, that um, the sink was our, our, our pool on a hot summer day. So the old typewriter, the first old computers, fur stalls, and how they were so excited to get their first fur coat where it would be frowned upon today, they took pride in the past. And the diner and the gathering and the social time. So now you have collected all of this information. You've really thought outside the box. What would really stimulate memories? How are you gonna do it? Are you gonna do it by yourself? Are you gonna do it with your loved one? This is how you're working with families. Are, you gonna, are they gonna do it by themselves with their loved one or are they gonna do it together? My suggestion is you do as much of the work ahead of time. You tell families do as much of the work ahead of time as you can. And what you could do is on certain pages, do you want this picture or this picture here? Or you have some pages, you leave a couple in with some tape or glue and ask them to put it in themselves. It's quite interesting when you do it that way. So you can do it alone, you can do it with them, or you can do it um, a little bit or a lot ahead and then do it with them. So here's an example of, of, of um, a situation. 
um, somebody took the, Wendy took the memory book into her mom um, and then talked to her about where she lived and how long she lived there and put the information into her book and listen to how the story started to unfold when she said, tell me, she was asking her about um, where she lived when she was younger and uh, when she moved out. Uh, I was gonna stay at home. And then the government put in the paper. Uh, yeah. Now I would love to have heard more of that, but you see what happened? She talked about she lived at home. She's 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 opened up the memory book. So now she's got facts and photo. The memory bank begins to open and the brain cascades start to flow. One point I want to make here is that a lot of people may not be able to remember facts, but they can express opinions. So once the fact is in there, then launch into the next conversation asking about an opinion. So now the book is ready. You've got so your, your book, you're filling it out. Leave the, the person with the book and then leave a pen handy. Um, uh, Wendy's mom and my mom, when I left her uh, with her book, uh, when we came back, they had filled in pages with their own comments. And that was amazing. Wendy in particular said there were things that she went, I didn't know that. And she talked to her sisters to find out is that really true? And the point that I want to make with this is it doesn't matter. If that's that person's memory, that's all that matters. So now we're going to teach the person how to use the book. Procedural memory, we can teach them when, you're, when you'd like to, to have a look at some of the pictures from your memory book. Pick it up off the table. What should you do when you want to have a look through the memory book? go pick it up off the table. We can teach them to go look at the memory book and eventually just sitting there, that will trigger the action for looking at it. That's, um, that's repetitive priming and we can use space retrieval methods to teach people to actually do it. So we're supporting the declarative memory loss and moving forward with helping them to put their action into action to use the book, that is success. So this is particularly important if your book has in a schedule. So now they want, if they want to know what's up for today, when you want to know what's up for today, look at your book. When you want to look at your book, but when you want to know what's up today, what should you do? Look at your book. Good. They have to have at least 10 seconds of memory to be able to do that. That's the minimum of short-term memory. So here's an interesting one. If you look over to my right on this calendar, this person, Every month when she got the calendar, she highlighted, she had very good vision, you can see. She highlighted all the activities that she wanted to go to. So one of the things you could have done is she could have put an X through every one of these when the day passed, so she would easily know which day it was when she came back to it. That's a great way to use a schedule. So that comes out at the end of this month and the new one goes in at the beginning of the next. So when you want to know what's going up today, look at your book. That's a great use for a memory book. Another way to do this one is you can print in here, my schedule changes daily, it is kept in the kitchen or type it up and put it in. I keep my schedule on a board. I check the board to find out what I'm doing today. It is, I find important notes on my board too. So for example, you could have a dry erase board like this to keep the notes on daily. That's particularly helpful if you're working for pe with people at home, uh, but it's also helpful for staff, just families have more time to do it. So another way to do the memory book is to, you've got the electronic copy, print the pages out. If you have the paper copy, take them out, this is spiral bound. If you look at this book, it is spiral bound. Take the pictures out of the book and then trim off the sides. Three hole punch them carefully and put them into a three ring binder. Then after they're in the three ring binder, you can put them in, um, once they're in, you can start moving them about if you want them in a different order. 
And then the next, oh, and the other thing is remember to use a font that's large enough to be seen. Then share with the person and encourage everybody that works with them to share the facts and the photos. Then another way to do this is once the book is created, start, you could have a whole list of questions that if you're in a, a, in a home, a, a care home, a list of questions that staff learn to use when they go in and look at the memory book with a person. What photos do you like best? And maybe they're only on one page. Looking at this first page, which of these photos do you like be best, Ruth? What story do you like best? Now you've asked a question where the answer is in here and you try to get them on a page that they know will be successful. And what we're gonna do is put it in a place that's available and accessible. So this book says, look at the board for today's agenda. So as she opens the book, it tells her to look at the agenda, which she learns is up here on the board. So now the agenda adds predictability, it supports memory loss, and I have my life in facts and, in, um, facts and photos. And the other thing that I was going to do, and I, it must have dropped, oh, here it is. The other thing that I would recommend is that everybody has on a name badge so that when you're working with them, we can call each other by name. That's very crooked, isn't it? <laughs> Let me see if I can get that on there. Right. So we wear a name badge so we can call somebody by name as we are looking at their book. So if we know they can read, not just the memory book, we're, we're strengthening the brain because we're the more we do it, the better we get at it. We can use the All About Me little poster, but we can help them find their way. We can help them engage in, in book clubs. We have all kinds of resources that can help set people up for success. These are some of the things that we do through Dementiability. Since our goal is to support memory loss and you want to work with them to know who they are and use their memory book and engage with them in long-term care right now, on my website, you'll see under the COVID resources, this, do I look funny? This is what I look like under this. So I have my name badge on with my, and that's why I say, I don't know what I did with it. I have one name badge that actually has my photo on it. So this is really what I look like. And now you pass this over, maybe they'll be a little more um, inclined to be engaged with you because people in long-term care environments, hospital environments right now, don't look like human beings. I know there's all kinds of other things. Some people wear their picture up here. Uh, there's all kinds of things, but we need to make sure we get past the um, difficulties of COVID. This is what this sign looks like. So if you go to my website, there are a number of posters under COVID. Please feel free to print them. There's some that you can do. This helps them to understand why they have to, why people wear masks and why they have to keep separated. And if you go to our website, we have um, books for people with dementia to read, to be reminded about what's going on and why, why families aren't visiting, why they're using a memory book and not seeing the person. So there is a UK version that Lynn, Lynn Fair uh, and I and um, uh, uh, another group, oh, I'm having a brain moment. Uh, we put together in all the references, Milford Care is, is uh, on the, um, the references are all on the, on the book about who contributed. But I started these here and we've worked together uh, to make, they make them available for people in other countries. So now we know why the behavior is because you didn't understand who I was and what I'm able to do in the present. Now with my memory book, you're better, you're better equipped to know about me my needs, my interests, my skills, my abilities, what I did with the, in the past and my spare capacity where my habits and behaviors from the past are showcasing themselves is because that's who I was in the past. Now you know that you're better off meeting my needs and this is why we need memory books. And most importantly, you're setting me up for success with dementia because now my memory has been supported and I feel better because it's so frustrating when I don't know who I am, who you are, and who's in my life. All behavior has meaning. Know the person, discover the meaning. And now we can connect. I have four children. Oh, I live in Toronto. 
we can use our memory books together. And we can do this with, with families from a distance when we do our at a distance calls. And one other point I want to make before I finish is here in some of the areas I work with in Canada, we're trying to create a plan in um, geographic areas where staff that are in the community, staff are in hospital and staff in long-term care see the value of using a memory book or an all about me page. So that if I move from the home and I have to go to the hospital, they open up the book and they get to know about me. So if the staff is there and there's no file about how many children do you have, do you have any fi family, it's in the book. So now when you do the questions about, you know, orientation to time, place and person, you've got details. In COVID, I know that's more of a problem, but perhaps you could laminate the book, put it in the binder, it could go, or just a couple of pages. I always say, find a solution. When you say you can't, I say, yes, you can. Let's figure out how. So let's take this information, no matter where we are, from home to hospital to long-term care. Let's keep the information and share it. So if you'd like to know more, check out my website. Um, many of our books are available. We have large print books. We have coloring books. We have um, a book for, uh, we have a book for, um, care partners it's called thinking differently about dementia it's available also on amazon as so is a, a my textbook so if you just go into your url and then put amazon dementiability you'll see some of these resources um, and everything's available through our website and if you are interested in any education zoom works so we can also think about that too so I want to thank you and thank Napa for inviting me to share these ideas with you today. I hope it didn't go too quickly, uh, but I hope I gave you some uh, insights that are, are a bit beyond just putting pictures into a book. Thanks. Well, that was an absolute wonderful session. Thank you very much. Um, lots of people saying thank you. There, there is one question in, in the, the box. Um, you mentioned a three hole punch. Why specifically a three hole punch? Oh, it's because I would never get them even if I did it all by myself. One, two, three. <laughs> I do, yes, it's a good, is, is a three hole punch a common thing in England? No, you two can. hole punch is, is more common. Okay, then do a two hole punch. That I did not know. We do a three hole punch and it's just that you can do the single, maybe I should use the word multiple punch because I, if I did one, two, three, they'd be, they'd look wacky in a book. So yours is, you also have, I don't know if you all realize this, you also have a different size paper than we do. We don't have, you have something called A3, three, four. A4, can okay, never get the number right. Yeah, we don't have that size of paper in Canada. So you can print on what works for you. Right. There's, there's Thank you for that question. Oh, see, there across the pond, things are not always the same. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, oh, sorry, there's so many things in the chat now. Um, right. Okay, I'm going to try and try and start. Let me just pause the recording for us.